This update nearly broke me. So you know it's gonna be a great episode. Settle in and let's get started. What's going on team? My name's David Tomic. I'm a registered architect here in Western Australia. If you're new here, this is the ARCAD template build series. And for the last few months, I've been building the greatest ARCAD template known to man. And it has been driving me crazy because there is so much information that nobody pays attention to except people like you and I. If you're interested in grabbing a copy of the template build, it is available through the Patreon down below. But if you're just interested in what is new in episode three, then you've come to the right place. And it's time to run through everything that's new. As you can see, we've landed on the layout page. And the very first thing you'll notice is the title block is brand new. So I've gone ahead, recreated the entire title block from scratch, redesigned it to be absolutely perfect in almost any scenario for almost any single photo. So let's go through it step by step. You'll see there's an A1, A2 and A3 cover page. I've gotten rid of all of the others. Every single one is a horizontal title block, allowing your drawings to span as far and wide as possible. So on the A1 cover page, if we zoom into the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see my David Tomage logo in the bottom left. If you're downloading and using this for yourself, obviously replace my logo with whatever you need. And if we jump in to the actual settings of this, double click, you'll see almost everything is auto text. So for example, up the top, if we go file, info, project info, we will see all our project details laid out. And all you need to do is go through and update this information and it will automatically populate everything else in the actual space. So for instance, if you scroll down to the bottom, the contact company is David Tomich and that's where David Tomich is replaced. You put your full street address in here, your email, your phone number, that all automatically gets updated. Your registration up the top is contact ID. So if you're an architectural practice or a registered architect, here in Australia, we have our own individual architectural registrations. So that would go right there. And of course, we all have our website, which is automatically linked down below. So if we were to simply go through that and delete davidtomish.com.au, press OK, you'd see that automatically change to contact web. Now I'll go back to info, palette, scroll down and paste my website back in, press OK, automatically updated. Scrolling across, we have our project type. Now, the project is a proposed dwelling, for instance. It could be a proposed commercial lot, mixed use, childcare, whatever you wanted. Again, auto text. Everything when you double click on it and it highlights gray is auto text. And if it's a word that's already pre-populated that doesn't have a hashtag before, it's in that project information bar. Now, what you'll notice with the client section is I've titled it as private. And in our project info panel, that comes under client custom because you still want to be able to have clients full names and details for the document transmittal, which I haven't done yet, but I will get to in the next episode, if not a little bit later down the track. So to protect our clients from public scrutiny, especially when you're going through local government, it's set to client custom and it's always private. So that way nobody's going to get some harassing phone calls if their last name appears on a public set of drawings. Moving across, we'll have our sheet name through layout and address. Now layout name and site full address come from two different sections. Layout name comes specifically from the layout name. So if I double click on SK01 cover page and scroll in, it'll be titled cover page. That way, if I have a cover page, ground floor, site plans, elevations, it is detailed. It's easy to understand what those pages are about. The site full address is of course linking back to the info panel, which I haven't populated because the site details are empty. So site full address, 123 Fake Street, John Town. Pressing OK and then OK once again, that'll automatically populate. Our revision table, which is again in project info. Now the revision table also acts as a mini document transmittal if you're trying to avoid using an independent drawing. So this is once again project info and I've created multiple sections here. You'll see that rev forward date is up the top here. So we'll export this as an XML, edit it, fix it, coordinate all this in a later stage. But for now, rev forward date is just up the top, unfortunately. Otherwise, everything else you would pre-populate. I've gone ahead and added basic information here just to give you an example of what it could look like. Once you got to the end of the fourth revision, you would then go back to the top of the list and start working your way down again. There's a very large red not for construction box in this project. This really basically just covers anybody from using documentation that isn't ready for construction. When it is ready for construction, you'll know because you'll be able to change that box from not for construction to whatever you like. So in project notes, up the very, very top, 
not for construction, change that, delete the not, for construction, okay, away we go. Now, moving all the way to the end of our page, of course, we have our page number, which I've just realized I most certainly should call that a sheet number because I have a sheet name. So for consistency's sake, let's change that to sheet number. We have the date, the project number, the drawn by, the check by, and of course, the stage of the drawing. I've placed all this information in the critical right-hand bottom corner so that when you're flicking through pages on site and somebody goes, check page X123, doesn't matter what, you can find it extremely easily. And then down the very, very, very bottom, you're gonna see a very long line. Basically, it's a disclaimer saying that any digital drawings need to be checked with a hard copy. If there's discrepancies, contact the firm that produced them, do not scale from the drawings, and verify all dimensions on site before fabrication and works commence. A basic copyright symbol protecting you for intellectual, moral, and copyright laws as per your contracts, and of course, the paper size, in this case, being A1. Looking at A2, it is identical to A1, just a little bit more compressed. So, A1 larger, A2 compressed, and of course, A3 compressed the most. Now, it'd be a pretty lame episode if the title block is what almost broke me. And no, it's definitely not. The title block was ridiculously easy because I've created so many of these in the past. It was just a matter of fine tuning everything that I've made before and creating the ultimate title block once and for all. What nearly broke me was the slab compositions. So let's have a look. Coming into our ground floor plan and going into our composites panel, I'll move this into the screen to make things easier. In the last episode, we went through all our walls. Not much has been added there, but what has been added is slab. There is so many varieties of slabs and so many differences that it is impossible to put everything in without being extremely project specific and extremely product specific. So if, what you'll see if we come to concrete on ground, we have a number of options. The naming system stays exactly the same as the wall naming system. We have our concrete ground 01-1, meaning it's the first version of that series. It is 100 millimeters thick of structural concrete. We have nil coverings in this one. It is uninsulated, but there is a vapor barrier. So you'll see our pens have been perfectly aligned with the reinforced concrete cut lines. Everything is fine tuned perfectly. It is 100 mil thick, and we have our membrane vapor barrier below our slab, three millimeters. Now, technically the vapor barrier can be as low as 0.2 millimeters. However, it's just easier to showcase as three millimeters. You get a quality line that is visible on drawings and documentation. So that's just something worth noting. Next, we have our insulated under slab concrete, R1. Then concrete with a 30 mil set down, a 30 mil set down with insulation, and a 50 mil set down, one with also that has insulation. All of these different elements just keep adding on up. For example, if you have tiles that don't need to be set down in a kitchen area that's not in the bathroom area, or a timber floor that is uninsulated versus insulated, there is an endless number of options. What I haven't still added in concrete on ground is a carpet option, which comes in later down in our series. If we move to our concrete suspended slabs, it's the same sort of scenario. It is an endless variety, an endless scenario of different compositions. I've made two as a generic starting point, a 250 millimeter thick suspended slab and a 257 millimeter thick concrete slab. This basically allows us a little bit of flexibility. If we're designing in timber frame, we're starting with the 250. If we're designing in brick coursing, then we're doing 257. Each one, again, timber, tile, set downs, no set downs, and everything in between has been added into this scenario. If you are using a concrete slab that's suspended, it is most likely gonna to have to be insulated underneath in a residential dwelling. So every single one here has R4 insulation underneath. If we move to timber suspended, it gets even more complicated. And I've made this one specifically for MyTech Posistrut. Now, if you don't know what a MyTech Posistrut is, let me show you. This is the installation manual from MyTech. And the Posistrut is exactly what you see in this picture. It is a timber truss with metal webs. Now, this is one of the most cost-effective truss floor systems going in the market right now, even more cost-effective than LEOs and I-beams, at least here in Western Australia and in my current situation. So that's why this has been detailed for this product specifically. Personally, this is an awesome product. I love this product because one, you can add a hebel on top, and two, if I keep scrolling down this document, You'll see that you can run all of your mechanical services through the actual trusses, even block them out to fit larger services without having to create bulkheads. 
that is an absolute game changer when you're working with very small spaces. And what nearly broke me is this document here, trying to comprehend every single span table and summarize it into a system that is relatively user-friendly for everybody for multiple projects without having to come back to this document every 10 seconds was a bit of a minefield, but I think I got there. So let me show you. You see that we have our posi struts in five different sizes, 197, 248, 302, 360, and 412 millimeter truss sizes, which is all well and good until you realize that you need a particle board on top before you can actually start building even higher. So if you aren't careful, 412 millimeters with two seven ceilings isn't gonna give you two seven ceilings. You have to add that 19 millimeters. So that's why this is labeled as 431 millimeters of structure, after which you can go ahead and add your timber floors. And the best thing about doing 40 center trusses is you don't need a fairing channel or a batten underneath the truss to line it with jib rock. That's why there is no fairing channel of 25, 35 mil, anything underneath that structural timber. It is a straight 10 mil sheet, which makes life super simple. Just to overcomplicate things even more, once you start working with trusses and you start working with tiles in wet areas, you can't really manipulate trusses to slope the way you need them to perfectly. So you need to set them down, which gets incredibly challenging without understanding the nuances of a MyTech truss system. So for example, we have all those five truss systems here again in our tile finish. We have our protection board, we have our tile floor, which is potentially going in a nice, beautiful kitchen, living, dining area. But then we're gonna step down directly into our bathroom area, which means we have to go one truss system down. So if we were using a 248 millimeter posi truss, for example, we would then have to use 197 millimeter posi truss set down from that original truss so that then we could introduce our waterproofing, fast screed, and our tiles. And if you haven't been paying close enough attention, most of these items have been custom tweaked and adapted for this. For instance, concrete screed doesn't actually exist at all in the ArcCAD template. But if I press OK, go into my composites and type in concrete screed, you'll see concrete screed has been custom made down to the intersection priority and all of the ID tags perfectly aligned, ready for the future steps of this building material. But that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So in summary, the Posi Trust system has been created for both timber floor coverings, tim tile floor coverings, and of course, tiled set down coverings with waterproofing and greed. It is generally so time consuming to get every single one of these line pens right to the exact item that it needs to be. So I genuinely hope you guys appreciate the time, care and effort that's gone into this so far. Last but not least, if you're working with timber, you're potentially working with a concrete top. And in this scenario, we're working with Hebel. If you don't know what Hebel is, it's super easy. It's a 75 mil thick, autoclaved, aerated concrete panel, light enough to pick up, light enough to install on site, heavy enough to create acoustic blocks and actually give you the feel of walking on concrete. But now we're working with even more nuances. We're working with truss systems, we're working with Hebel floors, and we're trying to figure out how to adhere our floor coverings on top. So it seems simple enough, tiles, waterproof membrane tile, away you go, no problem. But then timber, if you wanna use real quality timber, either hardwood floors, engineered timber, or something along those lines, you're most likely gonna need a 35 mil batten and then your timber floor on top. 35 mil batten is going to create an extra layer of acoustic insulation perfect for those high-end homes whereas if you're going lower budget and looking for a vinyl floor you can't lay vinyl floor direct on the hebel you have to lay a 5 mil masonite sheet first and then you have to lay your vinyl floor all of these technical details have been thought about have been implemented into the template and are ready to go same as vinyl carpet needs an underlayer it needs that soft walkable, pleasant material instead of hard concrete. In this scenario, I've placed a 10 mil mineral soft insulation layer, which is the underlayer, but it depends on your exact selection. Same as the carpet. Carpet can range from five mil all the way up to 25 mil for a nice plush carpet. The underlay can range from three to five mil all the way up to 11 plus mil. So each of these settings may need to be fine tuned for your exact selection. It's just way too many to be able to create one that fits all and just for fun i had to of course include all of the set downs with the hebel floors and the screed a completely different system to how you do the actual waterproofing and the screeding on a hebel system as opposed to just a timber floor but it's all been taken into account 
and dropped into the template. Anyway, that's all for me, team. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. If you're looking for the template build, it's available through the Patreon down in the description. Or if you're looking for one of these awesome human logo David Tomich shirts, it's also available at davidtomich.com.au. Otherwise, feel free to leave a comment down below. I'll reply to as many as I physically can. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.